Wonderful Words and Phrases is written and read by me, Albert Jack. Now to be drummed out is to be unceremoniously driven out from a place. It is a military expression relating to the long since outmoded practice of publicly removing disgraced soldiers from their regiments. Such occasions involve the offender being marched from the barracks in front of the assembled regiment to the sound of a single sombre drumbeat. In 1766, Thomas Amory used this descriptive line in his extravagant book, which many believe to be actually his biography, The Life of John Bunkle. They all ought to be drummed out of society together. These days nobody uses drums anymore, but many are still drummed out of clubs and societies against their will. Now, the original dum-dum bullet was developed by the British military and, based on the jacketed .303 bullets, had its nose open to expose the lead core. This meant that on impact, the soft-nosed shells would rip open and cause massive internal damage to its intended human target. Originally designed in the dum-dum arsenal on the northwest frontier of India in the late 1890s, they were soon outlawed by the Hague Convention of 1889. However, the United States refused to ratify the convention and so it never became international law in any war involving the US Army, which, let's face it, is most of them in one way or another. The reason they refused to agree was that American troops were busy at that time using expanding bullets on the Filipinos whom they had recently liberated from Spanish rule. A special note published with the convention explained the reasoning at the time, which read, Dum Dum bullets, first manufactured by the British at Dum Dum, India, are of advantage only in jungle warfare against primitive tribes where the danger is of sudden rushes of large numbers at close quarters. They are not used in European warfare because they are inaccurate and tend to foul guns. If they offered an advantage, they would be used regardless of any treaty. The expression Dum Dum has since been affectionately applied to any other soft-nosed cartridge designed to leave its victims' insides hanging in tatters. A feather in your cap is a well-known phrase meaning somebody has done something well and it's been duly noted, although not rewarded by any tangible means other than having a feather placed in their cap. It's an origin easy to explain. Any Indian brave fighting for his tribe in America who killed an enemy soldier was rewarded by having a feather placed in his headdress. The most prolific braves would have a hat full of feathers. 400 years prior to this, in medieval England, battlefield bravery was rewarded in a similar way. Knights of the realm who had shown great courage were also afforded feathers to wear in their helmets. In one particular event it was recorded that the Black Prince, who was the 16-year-old Prince Edward, the Prince of Wales of his day, showed such courage at the Battle of Creasy in 1346, the first great land battle of the 100-year war between England and France, he was awarded the crest of one of his defeated enemies, John of Bohemia. The crest was of three ostrich feathers and remains the crest of the Prince of Wales to this day. A flash in the pan is used to describe something or somebody making a great impression at the outset but ultimately failing to deliver any real result. Of military origin again, the phrase emerged during the use of the early flintlock muskets. Sometimes gunpowder would ignite with a flash in the lock pan but the main charge failed to light meaning the shot in the barrel did not discharge. Therefore, despite sounding like the gun had fired, no harm could come to either man nor beast at that time round. It had been just a flash in the pan. It looked and sounded good but had no effect and the expression was in regular use by 1741. To run the gauntlet means to place yourself at risk of attack from all sides, either physically or verbally. This one's of Scandinavian origin and relates to a form of punishment in the Swedish military. In the 1600s, the Swedes would punish soldiers or sailors by forming two lines of men, each armed with a short length of rope or batten. The offender was then forced to run along the passageway between the lines whilst his comrades beat him as hard as they could. The English discovered this form of punishment during the Thirty Year War between 1618 and 1648. The Swedish word for passageway is gantelope and this was later anglicised to gauntlet by the English military. This practice was abolished in 1813 but remained a method of public school bullying well into the 1900s. Now to lay down a gauntlet is to lay a challenge, originally of combat but latterly of any form of contest. In this case a gauntlet is a medieval mailed glove forming part of a knight's suit of armour. Traditionally a knight would challenge another to a duel by throwing off his glove or gauntlet. If his opponent picked it up it meant he was accepting the challenge and battle could begin. Taking up a gauntlet has since been a phrase used for accepting a challenge. 
Go tell it to the Marines is a well-known expression, especially in America, that is used in response to an unbelievable story or suggestion. The phrase originates in England when the Marines were considered inferior to regular soldiers and sailors as they worked on both land and sea and so were regarded by many as an expert at neither, therefore stupid. The idiom, which was in regular use at the time of the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, was originally, tell that to the Marines because the sailors won't believe it. It was in this full form that John Moore used it in the post-caption of 1810. And, just over a decade later, in the island of 1823, Lord Byron is suggesting it as an old saying by putting it in a historical setting. The expression became popular again thanks to a story told by Major W.P. Drury in the Tadpole of the Archangel in 1904. Drury later admitted his story was a pure invention and a leg pull of my youth, but it's still how the phrase passed into wider use. In his book, Drury described an entry in Samuel Pepys's diary from 1664 in which Pepys attended a banquet given by Charles II who was entertaining guests with a far-fetched naval tale about flying fish. The King's story had everybody laughing in disbelief except for an officer in the Marines who insisted he had seen such a fish for himself. The King was convinced and announced that if the Marines, with their vast experience of the high seas, had seen such a thing, then the story must be true. He also said that if he heard such fanciful tales again, he would check the truth of them by first telling the Marines. Drury's story had historians at the time frantically checking Pepys' diaries, and after an exhausted search it was revealed that there was no such entry. It was only then that Drury admitted he had made it up completely. No doubt he had spent the intervening time laughing at all the attention surrounding his book and laughing all the way to the bank too, I would imagine. Anybody who's gung-ho is bullish, aggressive and highly enthusiastic, but usually failing to take many important factors into account before taking decisive action. This expression was originally applied to Carlson's Raiders, who were a moderately successful Marine guerrilla unit operating in the South Pacific during the Second World War between 1942 and 1946. Their commanding officer, Evans F. Carlson, spent many years in China prior to the war developing his battle strategies by observing Chinese teamwork and comradeship. In China, the term Kung Ho means working closely together, and this is where Carlson found his phrase. Going at something Kung Ho used to mean approaching a task in an enthusiastic and committed way. It also tended to mean you were American. These days, in most of the English-speaking world, it is more often associated with carelessness and a lack of concern for consequences. During an interview in 1943, Carlson explained how he had learned the expression Kung Ho from his New Zealand friend, the communist writer Rui Ali, who had helped found the Chinese industrial corporatives in 1938 in support of the War of Resistance against Japan. The slogan of that movement was Gung Ho, pronounced Gong He in Chinese, meaning to work together in harmony. An ethos Carlson was trying to promote throughout the rank and file by holding a series of Kung Ho meetings. He explained, I was trying to find a way of building up the same sort of working spirit I had seen in China, where all the soldiers dedicated themselves to one idea and worked together to get that idea across. I told the boys time and time again and that the motto of the Chinese cooperatives is Kung Ho. It means work together, work in harmony. Despite Carlson's noble intentions, however, the word's association with bravery, recklessness and spirit was cemented later that same year with the release of a rousing movie about Carlson's raiders, starring Randolph Scott, simply called Gung Ho. Although the term later became differently construed as a result of Carlson's own bullish and sometimes irresponsible attitude, which were not featured in the film. At one time, he left nine of his men stranded on Makin Island, who were later captured and then beheaded by the Japanese. So, not working together in harmony on that occasion, then. If somebody's had their guns spiked, it suggests they've had their plans foiled. Now, the earliest type of battlefield cannon was muzzle-loaded, and the only way it could be fired was by igniting gunpowder through a small charge hole. In a simple but effective piece of military disruption, an enemy could put a gun out of action for a long time, sometimes even permanently, by driving a small metal spike deep into the charge hole, which would seal it completely. It was a tricky job for a blacksmith to remove it and consequently just a handful of undercover agents could neutralise many of an army's guns in a very short time by using this kind of sabotage. It was also possible to spike one or two duelling weapons, thereby ensuring a favourable outcome for a so-called gentleman. These days you're more likely to find it's your drink that's been spiked, although in a different way and for different reasons. can still put you out of action though. This has been Albert Jack reading from Wonderful Words and Phrases.